Good morning, my students. Welcome to Chemistry 411, Physical Chemistry 3. Thank God, finally, we've started. So we're all going to be up and doing because uh, we don't have time any longer. I hope you're going to enjoy this class. My name is Professor Engineer J.C. Igwe. Today is the 3rd of October, 2023. We are starting with Module 1.0, Atomic Structure and Spectra. We are going to look at the following, the outline of the lecture, introduction, the hydrogen atom, the hydrogen spectrum and boss theory, calculation of energy levels, energy levels of hydrogen atom, failures of the ball theory, some illustrations, and we conclude. Introduction. The postulates of Bohr's theory are as follows. The electrons in the atom revolve around the nucleus only in certain selected circular orbits. Two, the energy of the electron cannot change continuously. Three, the angular momentum of an electron around the nucleus is quantized. Remember quantum chemistry, we are trying to migrate from classical mechanics to quantum mechanics. You know, classical mechanics predicts that there is continuous radiation of an electron. An electron is a charged body. So when there is continuous radiation of that electron, then automatically the electron will be losing energy and the energy of the electron will reduce. But that is not so. And that's why quantum mechanics came in to explain the situation. So look at these three postulates. We'll also look at what Bohr based this postulate on to calculate the energy of the electron in the hydrogen atom. The solution of the Schrodinger's equation known as atomic orbitals, we're going to meet these atomic orbitals, we're also going to meet Schrodinger's equation, you know, just uh, elementary Schrodinger's equation. Known as atomic orbital, form the basis of our understanding, not only of atomic structure, but also of chemical bonding in molecules and solids. The hydrogen molecule is the most important chemical application of the quantum theory. This is because hydrogen has only one proton and one electron, and is very easy to model. Of course, we'll see when hap what happens when we come to many electron systems. But for hydrogen, we have only one electron and one proton. And if we also look at the hydrogen molecule, it becomes easy for us, two hydrogen coming together, the number of electrons still in the 1s orbital. So it's easy for us to model. The use of quantum mechanics to describe the electronic structure of an atom the arrangement of electrons around the nucleus will be surveyed. These are the things we are going to look at. But before then, let us have a look at the Bohr model of the hydrogen atom. So let's look at what Bohr model is all about of the hydrogen mm -hmm. atom before we go into Schrodinger equation, atomic orbitals, and so on. Of course, you should have in mind that this is part of an improvement in what you did in 100 level. This is a little advanced level of it. So please bear in mind and remember your electronic configurations. Niels Bohr used the principle of quantum mechanics to expand the spectra of hydrogen. And he made the following assumptions. The atom of hydrogen does not collapse. Look at what I said, that if there is continuous radiation, then it means that atoms will collapse. So he's saying that the atom of hydrogen does not collapse because there are certain allowed orbits called stationary states in which energy is not radiated continuously but in quantum. The stationary states are those whose angular momentum is an integral multiple of h over 2 pi. That is L, which is the angular momentum, is equal to nh over 2 pi or equal to nh bar, where n is the principal quantum number. Remember your quantum numbers. We're also going to meet these quantum numbers again. We discussed that in your 200 level chemistry 222. 
if the electron makes a transition between two states with energies E1 and E2, the frequency of the spectral line is given by H mu equal to E2 minus E1, that is delta E. So what we're saying is that this spectrum of hydrogen we're talking about is as a result of the movement of electrons. That is transition of electrons from one energy level to the other energy level. And which Bohr is saying that energy is radiated in quantum. So of course, he's using the principle of quantum mechanics, Planck's equation, which is delta E is equal to E2 minus E1 equal to H mu. This is Planck's equation, as we're going to see later. So we're going to use these three assumptions of Bohr to calculate the energy level of hydrogen, the radius of the hydrogen, the wave number of the hydrogen electron, and so on. The hydrogen spectrum and Bohr's theory. It is known that angular momentum of a particle of mass m moving with a velocity v in a circular path of radius is L equal to MVR. Remember your classical mechanics. MVR. Therefore, MVR is equal to NH. Remember we said from Bohr's assumption, we said that the angular momentum is equal to multiples of this. So if the angular momentum is equal to MVR and the angular momentum is equal to NH over 2 pi, then it means that MVR is equal to NH over 2 pi. And this is equation one. The electron is held in its orbit by electrostatic force that attracts it to the nucleus. And the nucleus has a charge that E. Now, when we talk about the electrostatic force, remember the electron is negative and the nucleus is positive because of the proton. So that means there's electrostatic, that is a force that brings two unlike charges together. Remember our Coulomb's law, Newton's law of gravitation, and so on. So we have this, it's also an inverse square law because look at what we have here. Z e squared divided by 4 pi epsilon 0 arrow squared. Now, if you look at this, 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0 is a constant. So we're looking at the charge of the electron and the charge of the proton. That's why you're having e squared. They have both charges except that they are negative, I mean, opposite charges. One is positive, one is negative. Electron is negative and uh, the nucleus or the proton is positive. So this is from Coulomb's law, like I said, or Newton's law of gravitation, inverse square law. 4 pi epsilon 0 is a constant. So 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0 is a constant. If you remember your Newton's law of gravitation, that the force is proportional to g1, g2, all over r squared. If g1 and g2 are the same, you will have g squared over r squared. That's the same thing here, e squared over r squared. This is a constant, and Z is the atomic number of hydrogen. For a stationary state, the electrostatic force must exactly balance the centrifugal force. Remember again what we call centrifugal and centripetal force in classical mechanics, in physics. For example, a student who has a key, you know, there is this kind of key we use those days when we were in primary school or even secondary school. You know, that has a long coily key holder where you'll be flinging that key. That's why when the key falls off your hand, it doesn't fall straight. It goes off at a tangent. The same thing happens with a rotating fan. If it falls from the ceiling, it doesn't fall down straight. It falls off at a tangent. So for any stationary state, this electrostatic force here must be equal to the centrifugal force. So we equate this z e squared over 4 pi epsilon 0 squared equal to m v squared over r and that gives us equation 2. Bear this equation 1 in mind because we are going to obtain something from there. From here therefore means that r is equal to z e squared over 4 pi epsilon, epsilon 0 m v squared. This epsilon 0 is a constant relative permittivity in free space. From here if you make r the subject this r we we'll cancel one of the R here, so one R will remain. We'll now make the R 
the subject and we'll get equation three. Now from equation one, I said you to mark that equation one. We now make V the subject and we have N H over two pi M R square. Therefore, V squared square all this will give us V squared N squared H squared four pi squared M R M squared R squared. That's equation four. Now from equation three and four, remember we had our equation three and four, three, then this is four. It means that z e squared over 4 pi epsilon 0 m r is equal to n squared s squared over 4 pi squared m squared r squared. If we solve this, we'll get equation 5 where r is equal to this. In the case of hydrogen, z is equal to 1, and the smallest orbit with n equal to 1, look at all these things are constant. n is the principal quantum number which can change. h is Planck's constant is a constant. Absalom zero is relative permittivity in free space is a constant. Pi is a constant. M is mass of electron constant. E is charge of electron constant. So we're saying that Z is equal to one. And for N, principal quantum number equal to one, we have a radius given by, we now substitute all the values of this constant with N equal to one and Z equal to one. And we'll get A zero equal to x squared epsilon 0 pi m e squared and we'll get this value, value which is equal to 0 0.05292 nanometers approximately 52.9 picometers and this a0 is what we call the radius of the first ball orbit so we're saying that the ball orbit the radius of the first orbit that is r1 we call it a0 from the nucleus to the distance where the electron is you know moving around the nucleus from that postulate. Now, from that equation, we start calculating the total energy, calculation of energy level. So, we know that the total energy in any state is sum of kinetic and potential energies. Look at it, E is equal to kinetic energy and potential energy. And we have our kinetic energy half mv squared. We have our potential energy as this. Then, from equation three, mv squared is this, we replace, substitute, and get for e. And equation 7 gives us a value of e. So it means that the value of this e is the energy in question for that electron in the hydrogen atom. The kinetic energy is positive, that's here, whereas the potential energy is negative. Look at it, it's minus. Initially we have plus here, but this is minus because of the attractive force between opposite charges. The sum of these energies is negative, equation seven is minus. This is because our orbiting system has a lower energy, a lower total energy than an electron at rest and at infinite distance from the nucleus. The kinetic energy and potential energy is true for any stable system acting under the influence of inverse square law forces. Remember we said that that columbic force we described is as an inverse square law. We move ahead from equation five, one over R, just pause the video, take your pen, follow this and you understand what we're doing here. From E, we now substitute. And when there is a change from N2 to N1, we now say, the energy for E2 minus E1 will get equation 9. And we can get the frequency of the transition from delta E, change in energy divided by H, we'll wow. get this equation. We can also get the wave number, which is reciprocal of the wavelength. And we'll have equation 11. And this gives us what we call the right back constant. All these constants put together. So we can cut calculate that ROH, which is a right back constant. From this calculation, we have this. Therefore, we can say that the wave number is equal to ROH, which is the entire of these constants put together, equal to one over N1 squared minus one over N2 squared. That is equation 12. So experiment, experiment value is 10,977, whereas what we have is 10,977. 
737 and you can see the agreement the close agreement of this experimental value and the calculated value from Ball's postulate gave some indication of the validity of the Ball's theory. Energy levels of the hydrogen atom. The lowest energy is that with n equal to 1, and for this equation, it predicts E1 equal to minus 13.6 electron volts. If you substitute values into that equation 8 and solve this, you will get this answer. This is indeed minus the observed ionization energy of the hydrogen atom as the model predicts. According to Bohr's postulate, an electron in this level cannot lose energy, and so it is prevented from radiating as a classical theory suggests it should. On the other hand, an electron, on the other hand, the electron can jump between the allowed level N1 and N2. Now he's making a transition by absorbing or emitting radiation in accordance with Einstein's frequency condition. It is this absorption or emission that we call absorption or emission spectra of the hydrogen atom. Also, from the energy level diagram, the lines finally converge. We are now trying to explain the energy level diagram of hydrogen, which we are going to see in the next a few slides. The line levels finally converge to a limit whose height above the ground level is the energy required to remove the electron completely from the field of the nucleus. That's what we call ionization energy or ionization potential. In this region, the line becomes more and more densely packed and finally merge into what we call a continuum. That is a region of continuous absorption and emission of radiation without any line structure. The reason for the continuum is that once an electron is completely free from the nucleus, it is no longer restricted to quantized discrete energy states, but may take up continuously ordinary kinetic energy of translation corresponding to speed in free space, that is half mv squared. The difference in energy between the series limit and the ground level is what we call ionization potential. That is the energy required to remove the electron from the influence of the nucleus. That is make electron free or knock out electron from a gaseous atom. Look at what we have explained. What we have explained in that slide is this. Look at our E1 minus 13.6 electron volts and this n is equal to 1, we'll call the Lehman series. n equal to 2, I've used that equation to solve E2, E3, and so on. This is Balmer series, Paskin series, Bracket series, and the Font series. Now, the continuum is here, where you have n equal to infinity. You see that the lines are now closely packed together. And all these lines you're seeing here is the frequency condition. That is transition. There is a transition from N2 to N1 here, from N3 to N1, from N4 to N1, and so on. We'll also come to know that it's not all transitions that are allowed. We'll soon see the conditions for spectral transitions. So this is the energy level of the hydrogen atom. And to explain this further, we'll look at the next uh, figure in the next slide. This is still the same energy levels. Look at it. Look at the Lehman series. The Lehman series takes place in the ultraviolet region. Balmer series takes place in the visible region. Look at that. All of them are shown. This time in kind of circular orbits. For you to see that, look at the first orbit, n equal to 1. Second orbit, n equal to 2. You see the third orbit, n equal to 3 n equal to 4 and n equal to 5. This also still explains this. And look at that equation we use. Delta E is equal to H mu, which is equal to 13.6 into this. So for any transition, we'll now note where the transition starts, which one is n1, which one is n2. And we can always calculate the energy of the transition or even the frequency of transition or the wave number of the transition. Failures of the Bohr theory. There are some reasons why the Bohr theory also failed. 
he could not really explain what was going on. For example, why should only some orbits be allowed? This is the question. Bohr's theory could not explain why some orbits should be allowed, why some are not allowed. Again, where does the quantization condition L equal to NH over 2 pi come from? No explanation where that came from. The theory could not explain the spectra of helium and more complex atoms. You see, we used hydrogen. Hydrogen has only one electron. If it's hydrogen molecule, two electrons, it was easy to explain that. But for helium, no. More complex atoms, it could not do that. Following the development of the Broglies, Krogenjar, and Herzberg, these problems became clearer. So we are going to look at uncertainty principles, Krogenjar equations, and see where we now move from orbits of the ball to orbitals, which are probability situations. Bohr's theory cannot be correct as the notion of a well-defined classical orbit is not consistent with uncertainty principle. The Herzberg uncertainty principle is telling us that we cannot know the position and the energy of the electron with all certainty at the same time. But Bohr's theory has given us the distance, that is R, which gives us the position of the electron, and has also given us the energy of the electron from equation 8. But that is against uncertainty principle. Therefore, it is not possible for that to work. So going by uncertainty principle and development of Scrogenjar and the Broglie, we will see what happens later. Okay, there's an illustration. Calculate the wavelength of this. That you know, very simple one. Go through it, and you see what we did. It's very, very simple. Thank you very much. We've come to the end of module one. We've done introduction to the hydrogen atom. The hydrogen spectrum and Bohr's theory. We looked at calculation of energy levels, wavelengths, wave numbers, spectral transitions. We also look at energy levels of the hydrogen atoms, Lehman series, Balmer series, and so on. And then we looked at the reason for the failure of the Bohr theory and an illustration. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoy the class. See you in the next class. Thank you.